the UAVs that we know of today are becoming more complex. So you're going to need a back-end system to support that. And what's out there, in our opinion, is not enough, right? You just don't need a system that's going to repair your product. Like, repair is not going to be enough. You're going to have to help calibrate these devices. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 83. How long does it take to get our new generation drones professionally repaired? If you ask today's guest, he'd say in less than 36 hours. Paul Corey is Senior Vice President for Business Development for Unman SAS. Unman SAS was formed by a group of combat-proven UAS operators and experienced business owners. The company has a 120,000 square foot facility capable of quickly repairing drones for most major manufacturers, in many cases in less than 36 hours. In addition to repairing drones, The company provides commercial and government UAS operational and regulatory consulting services. Paul is here to talk about Unman SAS, why the next generation drones require specialized repair services, and how the company's facility in Tampa, Florida is uniquely positioned to meet this need. Let's pick up the interview where I ask Paul to introduce himself. My name is Paul Corey. I am the Senior Vice President for Business Development uh, for USAS. My job is to try and work with both the OEMs, direct customers, as well as our commercial customers to try and uh, build opportunities to build business to service their varying needs. My background is from the telecom industry. I have extensive background in reverse logistics repair, so I understand that portion of the business very well. I've also you know, had uh, have experience on the consumer side through the telecom industry as well, so I understand working with clients, truly understanding what the customer experience is and how important that is to any kind of consumer business, how to maximize that customer experience to keep your customers. For those that are listening and haven't heard about the company, what is Unmanned SAS? So Unmanned SAS, or USAS as we call it in short term, is truly the only full services UAS company out there. We offer end-to-end services from regulatory consulting, U.S. program consulting and build, field operational services, field maintenance programs. We also have one of the largest consumer and commercial repair centers in North America. We work on federal, state, local, government agency programs. We also support B2B and B2C channels. USAS has offices located in Chicago, Washington, D.C., Toronto, and our main repair center, which is 120,000 square feet, is located in Tampa, Florida. The one other interesting part about USAS is it's a proud combat veteran-owned business. You ran through some of the the services. Let's talk about those a little bit one at a time. Let's start with the the repair services. Can you describe what those services, uh, how extensive those services are, what's offered, and and how it works? The one thing that we found when we looked at uh, starting up the company was that there was a lack of professional repair services in the UAV industry or the drone industry. A lot of our competitors, at least, are smaller operations that are supporting their local area that kind of start up from hobby shops almost. So we thought there was a lack of professionalism in that industry. So part of my background is reverse logistics, repair, and return services, supporting predominantly the telecommunication and consumer industry. And when I looked at the UAV industry, it's relatively new. So it's in its infancy when it's compared to more established industries such as the telecom side, which is to be expected because it's a very young industry. However, The consumer and commercial UAVs are becoming more and more complex with deep learning processors, uh, new sensor payloads such as LiDAR and microwave, and you're going to start seeing more precise uh, RTK positioning systems. You know, you're also going to start seeing 4G, LTE, high bandwidth communication receiver transmitters. You probably also noticed they're starting to, you know, just to try and 
marry between fixed wing and rotary uh, UAVs. You're starting to see the VTOL propulsion systems out there where they're going to start launching next year. So the UAVs that we know of today are becoming more complex. So you're going to need a back-end system to support that. And what's out there, in our opinion, is not enough, right? You just don't need a system that's going to repair your product. You're also going to need a system that's going to help. Like, repair is not going to be enough. You're going to have to help calibrate these devices as well. And that's where we feel we have the advantage. Our 120,000 square foot center in Tampa is a multifunctional repair center. They troubleshoot and repair a large variety of highly complex wireline, wireless, optical, electronic equipment. The center is like a manufacturer grade repair center. And one of the reasons why it is that is it was previously owned by another St. Pete company, Jable Circuits, which you probably heard of. Jable Circuits is the third largest contract manufacturer in the world. And so the Lean Six Sigma, the 5E type processes are embedded in this facility. And you're not going to see anything like it for the UAV industry, at least anywhere else. It just doesn't exist. Are you guys repairing all drones or just certain types of drones? We look at the larger manufacturers, DJI, uh, Unique, Parrot, uh, SenseFly. Uh, we're also looking and working with larger commercial manufacturers, the big $20,000, $30,000 drones, because we feel we can cover the entire gamut of, of consumer, prosumer, and high-end commercial drones. Uh, so there's no limitation on what we can repair. So the customer can be a large U.S. organization or it could just be an individual hobbyist. Oh, exactly, exactly. So the way we built our business is there's a, a portion of the business that's focused on the consumer side. So if you go to our website, there's a very easy-to-use tool to be able to return your drone to us uh, for repair. It's a three-step process for you to check the appropriate boxes, basically, on the website, and we'll provide you with a RMA and return instructions, which you can just very easily send your drone in. So that's, that's the consumer, right, that can send the drone into us. Also, because of our size and you know scales of economy, we're also able to offer to the consumer probably the lowest, and I believe it's the lowest evaluation fee out there. So when the traditional model right now is when a consumer has a defective drone and they want to send it in, typically you're charged between eighty to hundred dollars as an evaluation fee for someone to evaluate what the repair costs are going to be. Our cost is twenty nine ninety five. So we're dramatically lower than the competition. Our repair prices, so once we evaluate and tell you what it's going to cost to repair, we feel our repair prices are as competitive, if not lower, than the competition out there today. And our repair turnaround times, because we have the scale, are probably a lot faster than the competition. We commit to between three to uh, seven days of repair from the time you approve the repair to the time we have it shipped out to you. We understand that, you know, The key things for a customer is they want an easy process to follow. They want to um, have it repaired and returned to them as fast as possible. And they obviously want to pay as least amount of money as possible. So we've tried to manage that the best we can. And with our technical capabilities, we can repair a variety of different drones. Also, the real trick is on the parts purchasing to be able to procure the right parts because there's so many variety of drones out there. And we feel we have the right channels to be able to get that uh, material to be able to provide that service. How long has the repair facility been in operation? So the repair facility, it's been there for 40 years, and they've been repairing telecommunication equipment for that length of time. In the last couple of years, they moved into more different type of electronic outside of telecommunication equipment, and now we're starting to do drone repair as well. Is the facility owned by Unmanned uh, SAS, or do you just have a contract with them? No, we have an exclusive contract with them. They're not owned by us. Do you have an idea of how many drones have been sent to this facility so far? We just launched our consumer website in the middle of December. So I believe we have received like a dozen drones coming from direct from consumers. But what we're working on now is working on contracts directly with the OEMs uh, to become at least their certified repair partners. That's where we will get a lot of the volume coming through. As we ramp up the website and, you know, more people understand who we are and start sending their drones into us. 
My sense is that if you're using a facility that has been part of the JABEL circuit governance for all these years, the people that are there have the requisite skills to work on all kinds of drones already. But is there anything in a drone that would be different than what they've been used to working on? No. So they're used to working on very highly complex equipment. The drone is actually relatively simple technology, what we have right now, okay? Where it's going to get complicated, and this is where we feel like we fit really well for this industry compared to our competition, is once you get into the next level of uh the next level of drones coming out, right, with their advanced sensors, once you're getting RTK positioning, uh, once you start looking at different payloads, such as, you know, where you increase the fidelity of the payload, where you're looking at LiDAR, and where, where these devices actually have to be calibrated. So they don't just have to be repaired, they have to be calibrated. We feel that that is where we will shine compared to anyone else because we already have the test infrastructure in place. We have the expertise with the people. So we don't have to build any of that stuff. That's there today and we can go. And that is what the OEMs that we're speaking with, they recognize that as well. So that's why there's a push to try and get the certifications in place because they understand that and they understand where they're going. And even if it's not on the consumer side, definitely on the commercial side, we are by far the best option for commercial drone operators out there. And that's where we're getting most of our our leads is coming to the commercial side. And because the uh, repair facility has that long lineage in the technology repair, they're able to, to recruit the people that are needed or already have them rather than having to start a facility from scratch and exactly. look for people with those requisite skills. Exactly. And all the costs that go along with that. Right. That's the other reason why we can keep our costs so low because we don't have to go build, it's not a greenfield opportunity. So I think it's a great example of leveraging the existing skill sets of an area or of a resource. The one other thing that I need to mention as well is when you're looking at the commercial side, so when we're looking either working with the OEMs or working with large commercial operators, what we bring to the table, again, is very different than our competition because we've been part of companies like Jabil, where two things that we bring are the data analytics as well as the in-warranty validations. So today, when a drone gets returned to an OEM for an in-warranty claim, they have a hard time determining whether it's pilot error or a uh, equipment malfunction, either you know mechanical, electronic malfunction. We have the capabilities of doing that for them. Not in every case, but in most cases, we can let them know, we can do that in-warranty validation for them and let them know that this is either a warranty, a valid claim, because it, there was a mechanical electronic failure, or this was pilot error, and it's not a valid claim. So that's a big advantage to the OEMs. The other area which I spoke about, which is data analytics, uh, we have, and this is USAS, has its own data analytics proprietary software where we capture data all the way from the start, from the return of the product into our facility, all the way to the repair process, to when it's shipped back out to the customer. We capture all that data. And through our software, we constantly look at that data. And we provide feedback to the OEMs on components that are potentially going to fail. So they have a problem with a certain batch of components for them to look for. Giving them information which helps them design a better drone, where we show them failures in the current design. Also, we will show them areas where products coming in where there's no mechanical defect on it. So they need to, it's just a user error. So they have to either improve their user documentation or they can improve their technical when the call center scripts so that when a customer calls in, they can resolve that customer issue over the phone rather than having send it in. And that, you know, going back to my experience on the consumer or customer experience part, that is the best thing. If you can solve that customer's issue over the phone, they don't have to mail the thing in they're a happier customer. Oh, yeah. And so we provide all that data analytics back up to the OEMs for them to do that. We kind of boast this. We're the, one of the only repair centers that really tries to help you not send stuff in for repair, which is kind of counterintuitive to what our business is. But we believe in the long-term relationship, and we know that with what we're offering, it is going to be a long-term relationship. Yeah, it's pretty important because the one thing I hear most from a drone pilot, anytime their drone breaks, unless they have a redundant system already, it's agony waiting for that drone to come back, especially if they happen to be a small business and they're relying on that drone for income. 
Exactly, exactly. So on that point, part of our professional services package now, so you know, we've spoken a lot about repair, but on the professional services side, we also offer a fleet maintenance plan where for businesses that have a number of drones, which they own themselves, we can provide them with maintenance where we manage all their logs for them. We do preventive maintenance on their drones. And in certain cases, like especially like in the movie industry, where you need to have the the drone available to fly when you need it, we can provide emergency shipments, emergency replacements, spare parts management for them, depending on how big the operator is. We can we can actually carry drones across the nation that if they have one, we can have one shipped to them in two hours as an advanced replacement. Since we started talking about the drone services, let's uh, continue yeah. that discussion. What are some of the key services that you provide to either the government or to the consumers? Sure. So the services that you're talking about, we, we package it or we, we group it into a division called professional services. And in that group, there are four main sectors, right? It's regulatory consulting, where we are working with our clients to help them get the right approvals in place for them to be able to fly. We do program design and consulting, obviously, to help our clients that say, hey, you know what, I think I need a UAV program don't know what to do, don't know where to start, we'll help them build that program for them. And that'll be based on their requirements, build the overall program, design it and build it for them, including all the documentation they need and provide field training for their operators. Okay, so that's another facet of our professional services. For other clients that do not want to fly their own programs, we have an operational service where we can fly, do the field services, as well as the data analytics for them, and do the field operations and back office services for them. So all they need is they just basically stop contracting out the entire service, and we can provide that for them. And the fourth aspect, which I just mentioned a little bit earlier, is the fleet maintenance. So for larger clients that have their own drones, and they have a large enough fleet, we will do the full maintenance for them. So we'll do the preventive maintenance, we'll manage all their logs. If they are large enough and they have real tight requirements, we can stock equipment across the country for emergency replacement. So they can have something within two hours. For those clients, you know, time is everything. So they have to have the drone. That's the most important thing because the cost of not having it is more expensive than actually holding stuff across the country. Of the four services, which one right now seems to be the one that is gaining the most attention? The operational services as well as the program consulting are the two biggest ones right now. And it it varies with industry. So if you're looking at on the agricultural side, we're working with universities as well as we're working with a few commercial providers out there where we're actually helping build their service for them. Okay. In both those cases, they are not looking for any operational service. They want to run it themselves, but they want us to help them build it. And that includes selecting the right airframe, providing training, putting together documentation. So that is one area that's growing. In that area, do you get many questions from companies that have a sense that they want to create a drone operation division or a section, but they don't really quite know what they want to do with it? In most cases, they have a pretty good idea what they want to do with it. They just don't know how to go about doing it. But I think once you start talking to them, you show them other areas where they can use it. Once you understand their business, you can show them other areas that they haven't thought about where they can use the drones, right? So it enhances their their scope and it's better for them because it helps with the the cost model where they can reutilize this thing in more areas than they thought initially. We're also working with, in the public safety sector, we're working with, you know, setting up disaster response teams, quick disaster response teams to do the UAV operations. That's more on the operational side. Actually, this is what I find really interesting. Police departments for SWAT, as well as traffic uh, crash reconstruction, they really see the opportunity from a cost savings, as well as from getting data back to them, especially on the traffic crash reconstruction side, where they can get data back that they can keep and reanalyze and relook at after they left the scene. With using a drone to build that 3D model, it takes a lot less time than having officers out there going and doing the measurements. Plus, they get a different view, a higher view than they would get from the ground. And the most important thing is, depending where the crash is, they can open up the traffic area back to normal traffic faster 
using a drone. So we're working on some pilots right now with them to show them we're doing a case study where they would deploy their standard response team and then we would fly a drone at the same time and capture the information and we'll show them the results and how long it took and the cost and they can do the comparison themselves. So in a situation for a, a local government with a police department, the way it might work is when there's a crash and they're out there investigating, it, either they have a drone with that team or they dispatch a drone to the location and someone flies that drone around uh, compiling the images and the data that then can be used later on when they're, when they're back in the office. Exactly. So we can build a 3D model off that site for them. And it's either them operating themselves or us operating it for them. And it, it, it varies. They haven't decided that yet, what, what they want to do, right? I think once they get into it, they probably realize that they probably want someone else to operate for them. Or you get a bunch of local police departments coming together into a regional group and then have one group that supports that entire region, right? Because it's more cost effective that way. On the inspection side, we're working with telecom operators with cell tower inspections. Now that's growing and that's going to grow. It's more of the acceptance. I think there's companies out there that have put programs in place and now we're just starting to see where the local regional guys are trying to accept that as a tool that they can use and understand it and start to use it more often. But that's growing. We're also working with offshore oil and gas rigs, doing inspections of them. That's just a project we just started to work on. So that's another interesting area. And then we're working on some multiple government opportunities to do different type of operational support for them. It's that, that's more on the operational side rather than the consulting side. From the uh, regulatory consulting side, is there anything coming down in the future that might impact the drone industry, either providing more opportunity or causing some constraints? Nothing that we see. The one thing I think that we're trying to work with, which we think is going to be important for certain industries, telecom being one, utilities like distribution, like the, the hydro companies being another one, is we're trying to, and this is, this, this is a long ways out, unfortunately, is trying to get some regulation in place for uh, beyond line of sight flight. I know they're working at it, but it's, it's going to be a while. And we're trying to help the regulation on that side because we, we think that's going to be an important part for us to really expand this business. The other part that I failed to mention is our executive team their experience, at least, is very strong in regulated business. So we feel very comfortable when there's regulations because we feel that we can work through regulations very well and support the needs, whereas other people feel uncomfortable. And so other people, other groups are pushing off that, whereas we feel, especially for the commercial side, regulation is not necessarily a bad thing because I think you need to have professionals, especially on the commercial side, professionals doing the job. I think that's going to be really important. I think that's going to be one of those differentiators for this industry. You know, if we get to that point where you have professionals doing the job for commercial activities, then it becomes a little bit more of a recognized industry. Well, maybe you can talk a little bit about the executive team and who's leading the company and sort of what their experience has been. There's four of us, including me, that are on the executive team. Uh, Steve McKenna, who I think you've spoken to once before, his background is much like my background. He's an attorney. But he's been an executive with a number of telecommunications companies. So he, he has a lot of experience, a lot of contacts with turf companies as well as telecom companies. Uh, Rob Miller, he used to be a tank commander in the U.S. Army. And when he left, he started up his own businesses. And he's been a very successful entrepreneur. He's designed, built, and sold a number of tech companies. And now he owns Miller Companies, which is a private investment firm which has over 800 million in investments. Mike Morris, also a uh, ex tank commander, knows Rob Miller very well. They used to be, I think they fought in the first Gulf War together. He's our chief operating officer, very, very astute on the operational side of the business. So he keeps us well tasked on making sure that uh, we're doing the right things to be able to meet all the goals that we've put in front of us, as well as to be ready for all the opportunities that come to us. Pete Dwyer, he's also another military guy. He helps us with our field operations, as well as our regulatory and program consulting. He's our key guy for that. He's U.S. Navy. His last operation ended in, in 2016 out of Afghanistan. And Pete was uh, the UAS uh, detachment officer in charge for the U.S. 
a UAS uh, fleet out in Afghanistan. So he has a wealth of operational, field operational experience as well as regulatory experience. So we feel our team is well-rounded. We have a lot of experience in the operational side, repair side, as well as the regulatory side. I know there's, there's a lot of other groups out there that have uh, very good teams as well, but we feel like we're very well positioned to be a leader in this industry. For some of your customers or prospective customers, what kind of questions are they probably asking themselves at this time that you and your company could answer for them? I think a lot of the questions they're asking is there's a lot of confusion on regulation being one. They need to understand that better and how, how they fit in it and what's coming down the pipe and what would affect their programs. So we try and consult them with that. Another area of confusion, believe it or not, is the airframe. Which one is the best to use for their specific needs. And so we are not a manufacturer. We are a UAV agnostic. We work with multiple different OEMs from the consumer, prosumer to the high-end commercial drone manufacturers. And we will try to find the right airframe that meets their requirements and meets their budget, right? And we feel like for the different sectors, we have a nice broad spectrum of platforms that are available that they can use. We have good OEM partners that support us on that, so that all works out well. So that, that's one of the other big areas. Then it's just getting the data and how, how to analyze the data and what, how to make sense of the data and you know how can they use it and make it a viable program for themselves. So those are the main areas that they ask us to consult with them on. Uh, the repair side, you know, Usually a lot of people don't think about it, but they do realize they need it. It's unusual because in, in the UAV industry, they think about it a lot more because they crash them a lot more often than other other technologies out there. A lot of these guys have gone from trying to repair it themselves to realizing they can't repair it to finding out that, hey, you know, if you want to run a professional organization, you have to have a professional back end to support that. You can't try and do this stuff yourself. You have to have someone that knows how to do it so they can do it in a professional manner get you up and flying as fast as possible. How about on the, uh, the software application side? Do you have associations with other companies that are developing innovative applications that you're able to leverage into your consulting? We are working with a number of software developers to see what fits best. And again, it's not always the one package is not going to fit for every customer. We, at this point in time, don't have any plans of developing our own software, but we are working with the drone deploys and the PIX4s, PIX4Ds out there and the other manufacturers that are well known to see how we can leverage their software to meet our customer needs. Yeah, is it fair to say that it's based on the business demand of, the, of your customer, yeah. what they want to do, then how you match it up, whether it's an existing company or if there's somebody out there developing something? Yeah, exactly. So we're always, we try and stay well abreast of what's coming out so we can offer our customers a broad spectrum of options. But it's similar to the UAV, to the platforms at least. We try and have a broad enough spectrum of offerings that we can match capability and price point to our clients' needs. Is there anything that I didn't ask that we should talk about? What we see ourselves as, and with the clients we're working with today, they agree with the way we see it, is there's not any one company out there right now that offers the end-to-end -end service like we do uh, with the infrastructure to back it up. We want to try and take the experiences and best practices we have gained from our past opportunities or past uh, experiences in more mature industries and try and bring it to the U.S. industry where, you know, it's, it's still a very young industry. And we feel that by doing that, we can help adoption, especially on the commercial space. What would you hope that for any of your um, clients who do business with you, what do you hope that they... Uh, walk away with as a result of that experience? It doesn't matter whether it's the consulting or an operational or repair opportunity that we work with them on. We hope that they walk away with a good program in place that they feel that they can either run or it, it runs well for them to meet their needs. That they truly extract the benefits of this technology, right? That they don't feel like they wasted their time trying to use a new tool that didn't work. We want them to feel that the UAV is an excellent tool 
and that it should meet their needs and help them either reduce costs or improve services for their customer. That's it for episode 83 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Paul Corey of Unman SAS and learning about their drone repair facility and their professional services. If you want more information on Unman SAS or want to connect with Paul, check out their webpage at unmansas.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review on iTunes. It really does help. And I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun or research and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.